Um, today I'm going to be presenting on present communities of imagining, something we call Pekoi's. Um, basically, uh, this will become clearer as we go along. Um, I'm going to actually chunk it into different parts that will be very interesting for you, I think. Um, first, I'm going to go back and tell a short story about six million years ago, an anthropological probabilities of the species, and then uh, look at, do a more transdisciplinary jump in going into neuroscience, mirror neurons. How many of you are familiar with mirror neurons? Uh, a little bit, okay. And then I will briefly look at near peer and diversity peering. And most of you may, at least if you were my students, you know about near peer role modeling. Uh, and I did several presentations on that here at the National Foreign Language Resource Center. Um, and you can get more information about that. But now we're going into what we call diversity peering, which is more interesting, I think. And finally, I'll get to the present communities of imagining. And hopefully, I'll leave enough time for questions and we can discuss uh, things as well. If I start going too fast and you have a question, please scratch your head. I s tend to get excited about what I'm doing, and sometimes I talk very, very fast. So please slow me down. Uh, if you do have questions and you want to stop, uh, we can stop in the middle too, okay? So anything is possible. I wanted to start off with a little warm-up, and this is a little bit of a daring warm-up. Um, it's the turtle story, and the turtle story is actually a one-line song that my grandmother used to sing to me, okay? And what I'm going to ask you to do is to sing with me, okay? And it's just one line, and it starts down pretty low, and then it goes up a tone, and up a tone, and up a tone. And <clears throat> I'll sing it once all the way through by myself, and then if you'll join me, that would help me a little bit, okay? Can you try that? Okay, yeah, try. Okay, it goes like this. <clears throat> <laughs> a turtle trying to fly is more beautiful than a bird sitting in a tree with me. A turtle trying to fly is more beautiful than a bird sitting in a tree. One more time. A turtle trying to fly is more beautiful than a bird sitting in a tree. And for some reason, my grandmother would sing this over and over and over again to me when I was really, really small, and it stuck in my head. And it was just an amazing thing. But I never really knew why, okay? So the first question for today is, why is a turtle trying to fly more beautiful than a bird sitting in a tree? And at the end of this presentation, if you remind me, I'll tell you what my grandmother said, okay? and what her explanation was. But just for a moment, you might turn to your partner and say hello, somebody you don't know. And what do you think? Why is a turtle trying to fly more beautiful than a bird sitting in a tree? Talk to your partner. Introduce yourselves, please. Can you talk to the person behind you there? <laughs> Tim, come on up and join. <laughs> Um, I'd like for you to put on your anthropologist hats, okay, and with a little bit of a imagination, and to answer the following questions. Why did we stand up six million years ago? Think about it. Why did we stand up six million years ago? What was the incentive to standing up? Hmm. And the following question is later, why did women start birthing earlier? They went from 13 months gestation down to nine months. Okay, and this is soon after the six million years. Um, and three, what changes did early birthing cause in the group okay, that they were in? And I'm going to answer these fairly quickly. Okay. Um, anthropologists have been debating this for a long time. Some people, some anthropologists say to reach for more food. Okay. But actually, since we were already climbing in the trees, other anthropologists say, why would we need to stand up? because we're already climbing up the trees anyways. 
Others say to reduce body exposure to the sun, which is true that when you're on all fours and you're spread out on the sun, you actually, in the savanna where we were evolving, um, that it was very, very hot. Okay, and standing up actually reduced the heat. But you have a hard time imagining that animals would think that through. Okay, and so that doesn't sound very convincing to me. C is my guess, um, and anthropologists say this also, basically, that we were curious. We wanted to see farther. Okay, and you see this among cats and dogs sometimes. They come to the table and they put their paws up on the table and they want to they smell farther, they want to see farther. And so we were basically curious, and this was kind of the start of agency as well, the fact that we could actually change our body posture and get a thrill for, by seeing farther and, and understanding seeing more places for food, perhaps, and smelling further. Okay? So that was question one. Question two, why did women start having babies earlier? I asked my students, and these are some of their answers. <laughs> they got tired of waiting so long. Uh, the midwives got tired of waiting so long. They needed more people to play rugby with. Uh, D minus the parentheses is actually what most um, anthropologists say. They, because they stood up, it made the birth canal narrower and it provoked earlier birthings. Our whole hip structure changed when we stood up and started walking on two legs. And for some reason, yeah, the gestation period went from 13 down to nine months. Now, this is the exciting part. Um, <laughs> this is a picture of a young man uh, when he has an epic win on a computer game. <laughs> okay, And so it's really, really exciting, this part, I, in my opinion, the consequences. At first, the consequences were probably pretty bad. Okay, Babies were born younger. <laughs> Babies were born and still are born prematurely, okay, according to a lot of pediatricians. And, but it meant that the caretakers had a longer and harder job and had to spend more time with the babies. And they estimate that probably the numbers of our, in our species actually went down at first because they didn't know how to take care of them. Okay? But then they started spending more ta time with their children, their babies, and taking care of them to make sure that they survived. Um, J.S. is John Schumann, and he has a wonderful book out with his graduate students on just this topic, actually, on how uh, adults bond with children, and that's how communication starts, basically. And he says that his pediatrician friend says that the first three months of a baby's life is the fourth trimester. You don't have to laugh. This is supposed to be a pediatrician joke. But you have three trimesters, and a fourth trimester sounds kind of strange. <laughs> okay, but um, they're still, yeah, forming themselves. So on the positive side, though, anthropologists hypothesize that the increased time increased emotional bonding between caretakers and small infants. Before, they didn't have to take such, pay much attention to them, okay? And this increased time together made them bond, okay, because they were doing it. And this probably increased communication, as you can imagine, all right? And you have a small infant going gaga, and the parent is there trying to take care of them, and they go gaga back. And it becomes a, a babbling fest, if you like. And um, some anthropologists actually say that this was, along with foraging and hunting in groups and things, was this, this is what brought communities together and made communication possible to a certain extent. Okay, it could have been started out with parental babbling back and forth with babies, okay, as the origin of language. And so this kind of builds up into a more rapid development of cultures and communities, mainly because of midwiving, which is known in every culture in the world, that women actually come together to help other women give birth so that they can survive better, okay? And so this terrible thing, if you like, um, of being born prematurely, it forces us, this constraint, forces us to be, stay with them longer, to bond with them, and then actually to start communicating more. Okay? So bad things sometimes result in good things. Okay? So, yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you, though, a proto-conversation among babies. Some of you have seen this, I think. It's the talking twins, okay? And just a very short minute of it. 
but basically it's to help you to imagine. Of course, parents babbled back to their children, but then that evolved probably into words and phrases and other things. Um, I did my PhD on music and song, actually, in Switzerland many years ago. And there was research that was showing that actually the initial ways of communicating were intonational contours, basically. So when you saw a bear coming, you would tell your partner, <laughs> and these emotional contours communicated. Okay? And it was more like music than actual words. And baby's babbling is actually more like a song than it is actual words. So let me play you a quick video here. And you can have an example. <laughs> okay, turn to your partner and tell your partner, what do you think they were saying to each other? <laughs> okay. What were they saying to each other? <laughs> okay, great. What are your hypotheses? Anyone? Hypotheses? Yes. I thought it was like mimicking, mimicking, mimicking. what they hear people around them mm -hmm. saying. Uh -huh. Okay, just mimicry. Yes. They had a clear understanding that you take turns. Yeah, it was very oh. evident, the turn taking. Yes, good. Oh. Yeah. Maybe he had like a rising intonation asking mm -hmm. questions. Mm -hmm. And he kept repeating that. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. good. Yeah, intonational contour. Exactly, yeah. So um, the other people <laughs> have hypothesized lots of different things. One is that that's a refrigerator that one of them is holding on to, and the other one is saying, no, you can't go in the refrigerator. <laughs> um, but others say that, no, they, their parents must be ballerinas, and that's just a bar for like the ballerinas <laughs> and up and down. Um, uh, but obviously, yeah, I think they're imitating a lot of just what they're hearing, and maybe it doesn't really matter that it doesn't have any meaning. They're playing. And these are proto-conversations. And it's a way to bond and communicate without really having to worry about meaning so much. It's a way of being together. Okay? So it's very, very positive. Um, in our classes, we can actually do this sometimes in some ways. Um, can you help me? Oh, come, come. Sure. <laughs> We're going to have a proto-conversation, okay, as a demonstration. All right? You know how to count from 1 to 50 in English? One to fifty, yes. In English, okay. So we're just going to count, and I'm going to go one, two, three, and wherever I stop, you continue four, five, six, seven, and wherever you stop, then I'll continue, and okay. we go back and forth, and it's kind of like a conversation, okay? Yeah. Here's the trick, though. Between twenty, we start off good friends, but between twenty and thirty, we have an argument, okay? We get angry, all right? But by the time we get to fifty, we're good friends again, okay? Okay. All right. Great. One, two, three. Four, five, six. Ah, seven. Eight, nine, ten. Eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Sixteen, seventeen. Eighteen. Nineteen. Twenty, twenty-one. Twenty-two. Twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five. Twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight. Twenty-nine, thirty. Thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five. Thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight. Thirty-nine, forty, forty-one. Two, forty-three, forty-four. Forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine. Fifty. <laughs> <laughs> so you can do this with TPR routines. Uh, we do it with other types of stuff. Up, down, left, right, front, back, cheek, chin, sis, with little children. 
And what's really interesting, though, is that they get to express some sort of emotion, even though they're playing with the language. And this idea of playfulness is extremely important in language learning. And we'll come back to that a little bit later. Okay. Uh, still thinking with our anthropological hats, and I'm going to change in a moment to our neurosciences. Most of you are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Okay. And six million years ago, obviously, we were worried about having food and shelter and safety. Okay? Um, but probably in the last 3,000 years, they estimate, that we've gotten to the point where we, we have enough uh, shelter and food. Um, Clay Shirky, I don't know if you're familiar with his term of cognitive surplus. We work eight hours a day. We sleep eight hours a day. And the other eight hours, we're kind of free. It's a cognitive surplus. And we can choose to do and be agentive with that surplus, choose to do whatever we want to do. Go to graduate school, <laughs> for example. Okay. Um, so this cognitive surplus, at least among the, the populations who have gotten past the safety level, it means that you're really trying to self-actualize yourself. And you're, you're worried about self-esteem and things like that. And it's, it's a better world, hopefully. Okay, because of that. Um, so, but I, my caveat here is that I was in Indonesia um, two years ago as a plenary speaker at their uh, English teacher conference. And I was at the hotel and I got to sit beside this guy um, having breakfast. And he happened to be a UN uh, forestry expert. And he was traveling around the Southeast Asian countries trying to get the governments to lower their CO2 emissions. And Indonesia is due to take over China, I think, in a few years with CO2 emissions, because they're cutting down a lot of their forest. And I asked him, well, are you having any luck convincing them not to do that? And he said, nope. Uh, they're not worried about that. They're still worried about day-to-day -day poverty and physical needs and safety, tsunamis, volcanoes, and things like that. And Hans Rosling, some of you may know him. He's a health expert from Sweden, and he has wonderful TED.coms. And he talks also about how by 2050, if the middle and upper classes don't help the poverty classes get out of poverty, they're not going to really care too much about CO2 emissions, and it's going to basically destroy the Earth anyways. So we need to somehow help them get out of poverty, but also to, to educate much, much more. And so anthropologically, we are moving more and more toward agency and altruism. We want to help other people, in my opinion. And I'll give you more information about that later. Um, but not everybody's moving that way. If you're too stressed out and you're really hunting for your daily food, you're not going to be worrying about those other things. Yeah. So somewhere, the more developed countries need to help out a lot more if we want to survive on the planet, they say. OK. Um, so yeah, this is a picture of uh, um, basically poverty keeps your feet off the ground. You have no traction okay, to get further ahead in life. And that's why we need to help people in poverty. Okay. And for me, this is where the rest of the world, the more uh, advanced and more people who have the cognitive surplus, if you like, are going. It's toward um, agency. This is a uh, picture of two parents who are actually consuming. Okay? But the children are what we call prosumers. They're producing as well as consuming. And today, a lot more young people want to produce. They want to do something meaningful in their lives, and they want to help out. And I think we just need to give them more invitations to do so, okay? and to make them into prosumers, producers as well as consumers. And that's where the agency comes in strongly. How many of you have seen Ramachandran on TED.com? Anybody? He talks about um, his hypothesis is that 75 to 100,000 years ago, our frontal uh, cortex expanded and the mirror neurons kicked in. Mirror neurons, I'll tell you a quick story about how they discovered them. 25 years ago in Italy, they, uh, there was a monkey on a CAT scan. And the researcher was there looking at the pattern on the computer. And another hungry researcher came in and grabbed a peanut and started opening it. 
And they had been noticing how the monkey was opening the peanut, and they thought they were observing the motor neurons. But when the researcher came in and grabbed the peanut, the monkey stopped and was just watching. And the person on the computer noticed that the same pattern was there. And he wasn't doing anything. So it wasn't just motor neurons. It was also mirroring neurons, meaning that what you see, your brain is also doing to a great extent. And that's why when somebody walks by you and they trip and they fall down, you go, ouch. Okay? You're hurting. You did it in your brain. In order to understand it, your brain does it. Okay? And that's, uh, Ram Chamberan calls these also the Gandhi neurons because thinking about empathy, okay? that you have empathy for other people. And hopefully that would help and change people. Okay? Um, now, the most neural firing, actually, apparently according to Iacoboni, he has a book called um, Mirror, Mirroring People. Mirroring People. And he says that when you're actually doing something, of course your neurons are going to fire the most. When you're watching somebody, they're going to fire a little bit less. So now I'm juggling now, and you're watching me. But my motor neurons are probably firing more than your brain. If you know how to juggle, chances are that your neurons are firing pretty strongly. If you've never juggled and you don't know how, your brain might be confused and there's not, you don't know what to fire. <laughs> okay? So, um, and just seeing juggling balls, you're seeing an artifact. It's like seeing a tennis racket and imagining playing tennis. Okay? That makes fire a little bit. Hearing the word juggling might make them fire a little bit as well, but it's all a little bit less and less and less. It gets more and more abstract. You're not doing it anymore. Okay? And so for language learning, the idea is how can we get students to actually do it? Okay? More and more and more. Not just observe. Listening is good. It gets us there a little ways. Watching is good. It gets us there a little ways. But they need to really take charge of it and do it and make mistakes and they'll figure it out. Okay? So motor neurons are mirror neurons. They are affiliation neurons also. Okay? And they're learning neurons. They're learning how to do it as much as possible. This last little bit here on neural obsession, it's like being in love. And some, every once in a while, we have a language student who's in love with the language and wants to do it all the time, who talks to themselves in the foreign language. And I had a student in Japan who, when she was coming on the subways and on the trains to school, she would always hunt for foreigners and try and go stand beside them and listen to them and, and shadow what they were saying. And she was obsessed with it. And she actually said that in high school, when her teachers were teaching her English in Japanese, that she would be listening to NHK English radio channel <laughs> and listening to English because she wasn't hearing it in her English classes. So she's, she's, that's an obsession. Okay? It's really being language hungry, if you like. Really hungry. Okay, I'm going to go into the third section of this presentation and talk about near-peer role modeling a little bit and mirror neurons. Near-peer role modeling basically says that you, it's easier for you to model somebody who is very similar to you. Okay? And so if I was teaching a group of eight-year-olds how to juggle, if I had a video of an eight-year-old and I could show them that video that, hey, somebody your age does this, you know? If it's the same ethnicity, it's even better. Same gender, it's even better. Okay? Because they would identify with them a little bit closer. It's easier for them. So chances are your mirror neurons fire stronger when you see near peer role models doing something and you say you assume that you could do that yourself. Okay? There's a belief structure in here as well going on. And that works great um, as far as it goes, but I think for a globalized world, we're, we need to start thinking more and more about diversity modeling, okay? And especially at university level, getting students to go travel abroad and study abroad and experience differences is really wonderful. And it's something tragic that's happening in Japan right now. The number of students going abroad is going down every year for the last four or five years. And we're not really sure why. Um, mainly it's probably the economy and the job hunting system in Japan which keeps them there. And so we need to figure out ways to get them overseas more so that they can do some more diversity modeling. Okay. And diversity peering is 
more or less the same thing. I'm playing with these terms and trying to figure them out myself as I go along. But it's basically when you can actually pull in somebody who isn't normally your peer into your peer range, if you like, and say, yes, she's my peer. Okay. So this also happens interspecies, this diversity modeling. Uh, it can, where animals actually model each other and help each other. Kropotkin wrote a wonderful book back in 1906, uh, bouncing off of Darwin, actually. And the mass media was talking about how Darwin, survival of the fittest, was the main thing in the world that was happening. But actually, Darwin, in his own books and journals, talked a lot about how different species actually collaborated sometimes and tried to communicate and things like that. Um, this next one is a series of pictures that was actually in National Geographic. And this is in Canada um, after the winter. And a Canadian guy with a bunch of dogs had chained his dog out at nighttime. And he noticed this bear approaching. And it was from a distance. And he thought that that dog's dead meat. It's going to get eaten. It's, he's just come out of hibernation. He's, the bear is really hungry. Yeah. But the dog did something that was phenomenal. The dog went down on its front paws and it wagged its tail. And that's a universal signal among animals for play. OK, let's play. And the bear started to play. <laughs> and the bear came back three days in a row to play before the ice finally broke up and it could swim away and go hunt for seals. OK, so it's really amazing. OK, so at a meta level, I think that we can talk about near-peer role modeling, but also diversity modeling, and say, wow, if animals can do this, why can't we get along with other ethnicities and, and, and have more empathy for other animals, or even? Um, this does happen uh, quite often. All of us have pets, or many of us have pets. Uh, this is a wonderful YouTube video you can watch later if you want to. But the, this boxer, this huge boxer, is playing with this baby and putting its mouth all over around its foot. And you can just imagine the fear that I would have. But actually, there's the parents in the background saying, go easy, Linus, go easy, Linus. <laughs> and they're playing. And they're having a really, really good time. So um, in soci sociology, they talk about bonding social capital. Capital, you all know, is like money. It's value. Social capital is your uh, networks. And bonding social capital is bonding with the people who are very much like you, near peer role modeling, if you like. Okay? So bonding with people who are like you seems to be very, very easy. But um, these researchers are saying that a society that has only bonding social capital will be segregated into mutually, mutually hostile camps, probably. And so a pluralistic de democracy requires a lot of bridging social capital among groups. Okay? And I know in my own university and most universities probably all over the world, we need more bridging between departments. Sometimes they don't talk to each other. Um, different groups don't talk to each other. Um, I would love to see graduate students groups from different universities talking more with each other and doing exchanges and things like that. But we need to somehow bridge more than we need to bond sometimes. So this is basically what diversity peering is. Rotary clubs do this a little bit. I wasn't familiar with Rotary clubs until I went to Okinawa uh, about three or four weeks ago. And the person there invited me to go to this Rotary club meeting. And it was people from very, very different businesses coming together, and not just to enhance their wealth, but to enhance the health of the community. And they were giving scholarships to students going to travel abroad and things like that. So they were doing lots of wonderful things. And, but they were communicating a lot from different fields, different business fields. And that's a little bit of diversity peering. OK, now I'm going to jump up one scale a little bit. Um, and this is a chart that Satoko, actually, from last summer gave to me uh, on the number of NGOs and NPOs in Japan. Okay, And it's just over seven years. It's a chart. And you can see that the number of them uh, rises phenomenally from just a few hundred to 26,000 okay, in just a period of six years. And, um, but the other scale, it actually goes down. And this is the 
um, what is it? The, the number of NGOs that are accredited by the government. Okay, and so I'm seeing, I think, people becoming more altruistic and doing more bridging social capital and wanting to help others a lot more, identifying with them with their mirror neurons and their creativity and their curiosity. But what they're saying here is, we don't need to be accredited by the government. We just want to help. Okay? And that that's what is really meaningful, helping people. We don't need the government to say it's okay to help people. Okay? So let me summarize a little bit about what all we've been going through here. I know it's a lot of different transdisciplinary fields. We started off six million years ago, and we said we, this curiosity, this ingrained curiosity in humans made us stand up, basically. And, but this terrible phenomena of having immature children, uh, premature children, um, made us turn into a caretaking society, basically. And it built community, culture, civilization, if you like. But it's also, it also gave us agency, because with the mirror neurons kicking in, we found out we could do more by modeling other people and doing things like they do. And uh, for at least a lot of us, I think, we're starting to go toward the altruistic realm. Okay? And altruism is kind of a form of agency. When you can help other people, empower them, you feel more agentive yourself. It's a different level of agency, if you like. Okay? So we already talked about the NGOs in Japan. And some of you may have heard about the microfinancing in Bangladesh with Muhammad Yunus. He got the Nobel Peace Prize. <coughs> he was loaning people $10 just to loan. And he went to the banks and he asked, couldn't you loan these poor people $10? And he, they said, no, banks don't loan that small of a sum. And they don't do it to poor people who can't pay it back. And so he created his own financing institutions in Bangladesh that got a lot of poor people out of poverty. And he got the, the Nobel <coughs> Peace Prize for that. Another example is Wikipedia. Uh, basically, that you have all these people coming together that are writing up all this stuff. And they're hobbyists. Um, I remember when Wikipedia first came out, there was an uproar in our university. You cannot cite Wikipedia. <laughs> and now nobody says anything. Okay? And so it's the world making an encyclopedia a better encyclopedia. It's fantastic. And it's all voluntary. Um, finally, Rifkin has a new book out. I think it's 2010. It's two years old. The, oh no, it's 2009. The Empathic Civilization. And he is giving the argument basically that I just gave you. Um, he talks about the entire reach of the biosphere envelope is less than 40 miles from ocean floor to outer space. And within this narrow band, living creatures in the Earth's geochemical processes interact to sustain each other. <coughs> when you think about 40 miles, some people that I know in Japan, they travel every day 40 miles to go to work. Okay? Uh, back and forth. And it's, it's not much at all. It's like a thin layer of icing on the cake. I used to think of the Earth as this huge place that's alive. Okay? But God, it's really only this little tiny icing on the cake. And it's very, could be very sensitive to lots of different uh, weather changes and everything else. So he says there's kind of a race on between people being altruistic <laughs> and wanting to save the Earth and people wanting to be economists and wanting to get more money, basically. And trying to get people to realize you're not going to make any more money if we punch too many holes in the, in the atmosphere. It's going to be really, really dangerous. Okay. Hans Rosling says more or less the same thing in his TED.coms. OK, I hope I haven't depressed you too much. Um, but I'd like to come back to the classroom just for the last five or 10 minutes here. And this is a diagram. Uh, it looks really, really complicated. I'm going to go back and dissect it in just a moment. I'll show you this same figure in a moment. But this is basically talking about present communities of imagination or imagining and what we could actually do in the classroom to help people out. The conceptualization starts with just one person, but it's going to be starting, it's going to have lots of other people in it. But everybody has a past, and they have a negative and a positive past. And they're bringing luggage or baggage, if you like, psychological baggage, into a classroom. 
And they call these ACLs, antecedent conditions of the learner. And there's lots of research and communication studies that show that this is really, really important to be aware of. Many teachers are not aware of what are these people bringing into my class? Well, how, what were their previous classes like? And what is that impact? Okay. There's the present and how much investment. Bonnie Norton talks about investment in the present, in the class. Uh, how much heart are they actually putting into their, their present endeavors? Or do they want to do it? And finally, the third time zone is the future, of course. What are your dreams? What are your plans for the future? Now, all of us in here right now could be, I would call it, a present community of imagining. You're helping me to imagine uh, by your smiles, by your nods, by whatever. And hopefully the people that you're interacting with also in here will also do that. Um, and basically, you have the capacity at any moment in time to jump into your past, to jump into your present, to jump into the future. And some people are planning what they're going to do tonight. Some people are still reflecting on the class they had this morning. And so we, we have a very fluid mind that multitask all the time and we're jumping everywhere. When we can get a group of students to all concentrate on their past, tell me your language learning history. They start focusing on that and they start reading each other's language learning histories, and they start learning from each other, and they start giving meaning to their past, which can be very, very powerful. Okay? So these are the activities that we actually can do in these time zones, language learning histories. If you want to look at a, a booklet of them later, you can. There's a booklet here. Um, I have about 100 of these different booklets for different classes now. Um, but basically, we publish them and then give it back to them and let them analyze them and learn from their peers. And so it's a very student-centered way of thinking about teaching. Action logs and newsletters, um, this is in the present. And how much are you investing in the present? Getting students to actually write about how do you like what we are doing now in class, and then evaluating it and giving it back to the teacher for the teacher's benefit so they can change their teaching. Okay? And I have examples up here of newsletters if you need to have a quick look at them later. Finally, going into the future, uh, we do possible selfs trees, asking them what kind of things, what kind of jobs they'd like to have in the future and so forth. A 10-year class reunion where they actually come in one day and they have to pretend that they're 10 years older and they have to approach their classmates and go, wow, you look familiar. Do I know you? And they have this conversation about what they've done for the last 10 years. So it's talking about the future as if it was the past. Okay, and it can be very, very powerful for them. So, we presented some of this information at uh, AAAL in Boston just a few days ago. And um, Zoltan Dornier was there. And we started talking about belonging and near-peer role models and possible selves. And most of you are familiar probably with the L2 the ideal L2 self theory with Zoltan Dornier, which is looking into the future, what is my goal, my ideal L2 self? And I and my colleagues started playing with it, and we started saying, well, what about the ideal L2 group? OK, let's think bigger than just the ideal self. What about the ideal L2 group? You're a class of students learning this language. How can you ideally help each other and support each other and make it a better learning environment? Okay. Also, I'm very, I love scaffolding things. And for me, possible selves, that's kind of like what I'm going to do when I finish school. Um, ideal L2 self, that's a long way away. And I really want people to concentrate more on the immediacy now. And so I'm playing with the term of L, ideal L2 learning self. So how can I be a great learner now in the present? And how can I help my classmates? And how could my classmates help me? How can I get the, my class to have that conversation with each other about, we're going to be here three months or six months together. How can we support each other better? And why, how can we, as teachers, turn that over to students to reflect on? How would you like to be at the end of the semester, okay? instead of the distant, distant future? Okay, so we also say that a pasts are always emerging. 
Um, if you tell your story about yourself today, um, you tell it in one way, but if you tell it about it tomorrow, you're one day wiser, hopefully, and you might give different meaning to it. Okay? So pasts are not set in stone. They're emerging pasts. Leo Van Leer gave a wonderful presentation at AAAL just about this theme. Um, and of course, we have emerging futures, and the presents are always changing. So this, we call it this he or she, a wicked eyebrows. <laughs> And it looks like they have wicked eyebrows. Um, but you have to imagine that there's 30 of these in a class, perhaps, and they're all together in this present community of imagining. And the whole point of bringing up a term like present communities of imagining is to try and refocus our attention on the present and on the possibility that we might imagine. Okay, Imagine something better for ourselves, better for the school, better for the world. And express our agency in that way and our altruism and have invitations to do so. Okay? And you have that on your handout as well. Um, there is an article coming out in the Wiley Encyclopedia this year in the fall uh, by Joe Fallett and myself that is talking about this. And we have several other book chapters that will be out hopefully soon. And this is uh, a diagram that's in an article that will be out soon also. But basically, it's talking about dialectics between autonomy and collaboration or, or community. And then within a community, you have dialectics also of homogeneity and diversity. Okay? And if you have too much homogeneity in a group, it's too much the same, and it can get really, really boring. And even a class who bonds really well together can get boring after a while. It's nice to infuse it with something different. Too much diversity, though, would be really, really confusing. Okay? If, we had, if everybody in the classroom spoke a different language, it would be really problematic. But nevertheless, business teams, especially in group dynamics literature, always say we need to get more diversity in the groups, that more interesting innovations happen when we have more diversity. So we probably should go from near peer role modeling and use it as teachers, but also start bringing in a little bit of diversity into our classrooms or letting them notice the diversity and benefit from it as much as possible. So uh, now I'm on the diversity peering kick. Okay. Okay. Just about finished. We're recapping. Um, I don't need to say this. You already heard it. Yes. I want to finish on time. Turtle. Ah, turtle. Um, ah, <laughs> before we do the turtle thing, <laughs> can I ask you to sing with me one more time? Um, for me, this is kind of an answer to the question of how we get change, okay? And it kind of goes like this. <clears throat> Let me just go ahead and bring it all down. So it goes like this. <clears throat> I'll sing it through twice so you get the melody. Be the change, be the change, be the change you wish to see in the world. I don't serve my dear world by pretending to be small. I'll stand tall, I will stand tall. When you change yourself, you change the world. Please sing with me. Be the change, be the change, be the change you wish to see in the world. I don't serve my dear world by pretending to be small. I'll stand tall, I will stand tall. When you change yourself, you change the world. And you know who these words are from? Uh, yes? <laughs> it's Gandhi and then Michael Jackson. <laughs> OK, I'm trying to bridge the past and the future here <laughs> with my students. Um, and basically, the whole idea of students not having the self-esteem or the self-actualization power and saying, no, I can't help anybody. I can't help myself. 
trying to get them, you can serve the world and you can make a difference. And you just have to stand tall and be brave. And yeah, when you change yourself, you do change the world. Yes. So I hope all of you will change the world as well. Thank you very much. Ah, the turtle. The turtle. <laughs> as for the turtle, my grandmother said, you'll figure it out. Have a good life. <laughs> <laughs> okay.